Welcome to Canada's podcast. Hello, I'm Mario Taniguzzi, Managing Editor of Edmonton's Podcast. Joining me today is Carly Gramlich, who is founder and CEO of Upper District in Edmonton. Thanks for joining us today, uh, Carly. Thanks for having me. Well, let me just start by asking you, tell me a little bit about uh, Upper District, what it is and what you do. So I'm the founder and CEO. Um, We're about six and a half years old. and We're a Canadian-based sustainable luxury fashion and accessories brand. So we've launched our eyewear line. We're currently building out our expansion. Um, That involves apparel with the ability for um, tracking impact, guaranteeing authenticity, and the ability for resale. So um, in, do you have like a physical presence uh, in Edmonton or can you talk a little um, bit about that? Yeah. So right now we're kind of building out more so our physical retailer side of things, um, eventually kind of moving into omni-channel as well. But ultimately what we decided initially was working with physical. So as a newer brand, um, we really wanted, especially within luxury, we really wanted to hone in on that customer experience. So the way to do that, we felt um, in terms of like our budgeting constraints, the best way to do it would be through physical. So partnering with retailers who are, you know, kind of well aligned with our brand values, our story, and can really kind of convey that to the consumer. So we work kind of in conjunction with them. Um, but with that being said, right now, we're also, yeah, kind of building out the e-commerce side of things as well and kind of finessing our digital journey. So so um, in terms of uh, the, the types of products that you have, maybe you could talk a little bit about the range there. Yeah. So we've got our eyewear lines right now. Um, our physical retailers always get kind of first, first dibs at our new collection releases. Um, again, it's it's taken some time. We're really finessing our products in that sense as well, kind of our manufacturing, um, you know, the logistics and all that good stuff. And then um, we're working on our ready to wear apparel. So that'll be coming through probably in the next 18 to 24 months, I'd say. Okay. What's the history behind this? How did this start? And why? You know, it was always it was always kind of an, an interest of mine turned hobby turned passion. <laughs> um, ultimately I, I grew up, I come from pretty humble roots. So I grew up as a farmer's daughter. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, my mom left when we were kids. So I was raised by a single dad. So, you know, the world of luxury literally was a world away. It was something that was completely out of reach. Um, and as I got older, it was kind of the, the details surrounding it. And, you know, it was more of a kind of the psychological side that really drew me to it. You know, it, it was, like I said, a world away. There were a lot of unknowns. And I really wondered kind of what drew people to luxury, um, what kind of experience came with it, what kind of, you know, products really resonated with people. Um, so as I got older, I started to kind of look into it a little bit more. Granted, I I went kind of the traditional route, so, you know, graduating high school, going to university, I actually have a healthcare background. Um, but it was when I was 26 that I, I really decided to kind of pursue this passion of mine. So um, at that time, you know, I was married. We were actually struggling to start a family. And it was kind of one of those moments where you really sit back in life and think about what truly makes you happy. And that's ultimately when I decided to take that leap of faith. So hmm. what is yeah. it, uh, do you think, that pe- that why people are attracted to luxury? You know, uh, you know whether it's a, a vehicle like a Ferrari or eyewear I- or whether it's a, uh, an estate home, uh, you know, what is the draw? luxury i honestly think it's not the financial value that comes from it but rather you know kind of a a personal value more personal value so something you've worked incredibly hard for Mm. and now you've you've really you know been able to obtain um and then it's to me more of a, a personal satisfaction and kind of um you know um what would be the best way to describe it kind of that reward it makes you feel good too right yeah yeah absolutely (laughs) to know that you have i have a ferrari (laughs) yeah (laughs) right i I mean to to everybody it kind of means something different but for me personally would be that you know that that piece that you've worked so incredibly hard for yeah yeah what are your plans uh for the for the business well first of all i just want to go back uh uh how'd you come up with the name upper district you know what? It kind of hit me one day and it really resonated. <laughs> I wanted something with a very, you know, refined feel to it. And um, I was actually just driving to my day job at the time. 
and it hit. So what was your deal? It had a very upscale feel. I actually am a dental hygienist. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. that's where where this all came from. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, you, you know when um when you look at the the company going forward, so what are your plans for for the company? So right now we're kind of building in tandem within Canada and the US. Um and then from there, we've kind of been in discussions with um, European retailers. So mm. building out our European expansion, um, we've also been in conversations with um, large groups and retailers in the Middle East. So we're looking at um, the UAE in probably three to five years. Um, we've also been in very early discussions with retailers in China as well. Um, so looking at, you know, Tmall Luxury Pavilion, Lane Crawford, um, we're going to take the Asian expansion a little bit slower just because of the intricacies and well, you know, just about every element of business. So that one will probably move within the next, like say five plus years. Okay. Then yeah. now in looking at your bio, one thing mm -hmm. struck me uh, and, and it was in quotes. Well, I put it in quotes. Uh, <laughs> you, you described yourself as being unapologetically unconventional. Okay. You're going to have to describe that for me. What does that mean and why? So where that all comes from, ultimately, is my background. I wasn't born into a family, you know, of wealth or a well-connected family. So I've built this from scratch as a farmer's daughter with absolutely no financial backing, no network, and have really had to take it right from day one. Mm -hmm. So I think that's unique in the sense that I bring a really unique perspective to luxury because technically I am an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I consider myself unapologetically unconventional because I'm not someone that's typically found within the industry. But I think I bring so much value in terms of that unique perspective and kind of a, a different mindset. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, farm life. Uh, uh, yeah. so where did you grow up? So I grew up about three hours. Um, that'd be east of Edmonton. Um, it's a really small village. There's about 500 people. Um, Edgerton, Alberta is the name of it. So I grew up about 15 minutes north of Edgerton. I went to school K to 12 there. Um, it's a very small, tight knit community. Um, and <laughs> when they say it takes a village to raise, you know, raise a child, that is definitely the case in my sense. So, um, we were very active and in lots of different sports and everybody within the community has kind of pitched in to help raise my brother and I, which was fantastic. So what, um, uh, what did your, uh, father do, uh, in terms of He's a farm? farmer, uh, just a small grain farm. So canola, barley, um, wheat were kind of the main, and then we had a, just a few, you know, kind of livestock as well. So some cattle and that type of thing, but. And what about yourself growing up? Uh, what were your kind of like, I guess, daily chores? Oh, we had chickens. <laughs> so part of, part of our chores were gathering and washing eggs and, and just kind of helping any, anywhere we could. So as we got older, um, harvest was always a big time. So my dad would drive the combine, my brother and I would drive the grain trucks and load and unload and that type of thing, kind of move augers around. So huh? um, it taught, we, we were taught the value of hard work very early on. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. Like when you look back at uh, growing up on the farm, outside of the hard work, what what other lessons uh, uh, did you learn uh, from growing up in that environment that that obviously uh, you know did you well uh, for setting you up for where you are today? Perseverance and grit. <laughs> you work hard for what you want, and you don't give up. Yeah. Um, so a big part of that too was, I mean, like I said, we didn't have a ton of money, so it was really being financially smart um and making you know choices that were going to kind of set you up for success in the long run which is funny because as an entrepreneur sometimes um <laughs> that was one of my biggest fears and kind of you know stepping outside of my comfort zone was kind of the financial side of things um but yeah definitely just a lot of perseverance a lot of grit and really working for what you want mm -hmm. now um do you go back to the farm always oh Always. Yep. Um, it's honestly one of my favorite places in the world to be. And my kids too, I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old and they just, they love being out there with their grandpa and now grandma. Um, I have a stepmom as well. And so we, we try to get out there as much as possible. Now, besides obviously uh, the people element to it, what's the, appeal for you to being back on the farm? 
it's so serene. It's quiet. And it's a place where you can really kind of take a deep dive into, you know, kind of the mental side of things and just think. Um, when I was out there growing up, like we, we didn't have, you know, TV or anything like that. We had the two kind of local channels. So we spent a ton of time outside. We were very active kids. And even now when I go out there, you know, in the summer, I'll go for walks and runs and bike rides. And in the winter, I'll take my cross country skis out there and ski. And it's just, it's a place where I can really go and think and clear my head. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. as you embarked on uh, this entrepreneurial journey uh, a few years back, um, you know, if you can rewind the clock for a second, what were the the toughest challenges you faced uh, setting up a business and, and starting a business? Oh, my gosh. I feel like there's a laundry list of them, to be honest with you. Um, you know, kind of taking that initial leap was a big one. And then going into it essentially blind. Um, mm -hmm. The passion was there, but it was a sink or swim, learn as you go, figure it out and, yeah. you know, essentially learn everything you possibly can, read everything you can, you know, kind of build a network, find your mentors. Um, but one of the biggest challenges that we faced early on was with our U.S. trademark. So the trademark in Canada went through without any issues. Um, in the States, we moved through the entire process until it, it passed through the examiner. Um, and then it was published in the Gazette, which it kind of leaves it open for other companies to essentially dispute it if they feel that it's too, too close to theirs. So it was the absolute, it was the last day that it was published in the Gazette. We got hit with a dispute. Mm. Um, and it was two, was it two or two and a half years of legal battle? Oh, wow. And yes. And as a young brand, it was a matter of like, do we just throw our hands up and give up? Or do we sink the money into it, fight through it? Um, because we knew early on that we had a good chance of winning the case. It was just a matter of, did we ha have the financial means to push through it? Yeah. Um, so that was a big, a big one for me. It took a lot of you know, it, there was a lot of strain, um, and kind of a matter of like the other side essentially expected us to just throw our hands up in the air and say, okay, fine, you can have it. Um, we give up, but ultimately we pushed through and we got it. Um, but it was a very stressful time. It was a, you know, two years of not knowing whether or not the brand was going to survive yeah. or whether or not we were going to make that move into the States. So um, that was one of the biggest challenges we faced early on. And then from there, it's just been obviously be being very strategic financially. Um, we've been bootstrapped thus far. We're looking at doing a raise, but really having to hone in on where, you know, we're, we're putting those resources. Mm -hmm. What do you think so, uh, it was that got you through that time? Grit and perseverance. <laughs> oh, right back to the fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and just really passionate about it. Um, I I visualized what I wanted, where I wanted to be, and I knew that I was going to get there despite the obstacles. So just just being very, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just kind of feeding off the, the the whole the passion of it ultimately. What advice would you give uh, uh, people who want to start up a business? I would honestly say fiercely protect your mental health because it's going to take a beating. Hmm. So establish early on what's going to keep you grounded and, you know, where you're, you know, have that strong visual of where you see yourself, what you're working so hard towards. And not just that, but your purpose and your intention. Think of kind of a greater good of what you're working towards too and what you want to be able to offer. Um, because in times where it's really challenging, that's what's going to keep you going. Yeah. Um, so for example, you know, my my purpose and my life intention is to really empower women and girls. And and ultimately as I get further down this line, that's what I want to be able to focus on as well. So keep kind of the bigger picture in mind. Um and just yeah, find find what 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 you can also do to help kind of step away from it and how you're going to compartmentalize that stress because it's going to hit like a freight train. So, mm, yeah. Um, 
Do you think that yeah. part of it, that mental health part of it, is is something that a lot of entrepreneurs really don't pay enough attention to? Absolutely. I think they know that they're going to run into obstacles, and but they don't know just how much of an effect it's going to have. So you really kind of have to step back and almost look at yourself from an outside perspective and kind of look for the red flags. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I find I have to do that. I have to be really in tune with myself as well, because again, I have two small kids and I don't ever want, you know, the stress I feel ultimately to, to have an effect on them. So um, again, it's kind of stepping back and really analyzing where those, you know, those red flags are essentially, um, I would say, yeah. Stepping back also, you know, uh, you know, we can talk about the stepping back from the actual business, right? Uh, because uh, as we all know, it's almost, you know, for many, a 24-7 job. It's all consuming, uh, yeah. It really is, consumes everything of yours. So what do you do to kind of step back and, and maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, try to find that work-life balance that everybody try, uh, talks about these days? So. Um, I, I've always been fit and healthy and I, I really emphasize kind of my, my physical fitness as well. My physical fitness and my, you know, mental health are directly correlated. Mm -hmm. Um, so if one tends to slip, the other will. So I really kind of focus on just exercising every day, um, whether it be, you know, kind of vigorous exercise five days a week, and then maybe doing a little bit of yoga or something, you know, lighter on weekends, um, and just really kind of keeping in mind what I love to do. So in the summer, my favorite place to be is on the water. So I'll go out on my paddleboard, I'll float um, and just kind of, you know, bring a book or a magazine and kind of step back from it that way. And in the winter, as I mentioned, I like to, to ski and snowboard and cross country ski and I play hockey and, you know, just really kind of not only connecting with others and kind of maintaining those social relationships, but also just kind of finding that space to connect mentally. Mm -hmm. Now, do you find, uh, you know, that, um, especially like for your children, but also for, uh, for others, you, 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 you can be an, ex you can like you personally <laughs> can be an example an example of, uh, you know, you know, from, from where you came, to where you are today is that uh, something that you think about oh absolutely um and that's why i had mentioned before about kind of finding that intention and your life purpose and yeah. and mine is really i really want to be able to empower and inspire women and girls and like in all honesty god gave me two girls for a reason like i have two daughters and i want to be the best role model that i can for them um and and just really anyone that is kind of on the same path and that's where you know, in terms of the business, we've tied my upbringing and my story into the brand story. Like we, that's why we say we're, we're for those who have, you know, kind of who have earned luxury, who have worked through those trials and tribulations to really persevere. Um, because I, I, I've come from nothing. So, you know, I, I love to empower and inspire from a few different angles, but absolutely. So when it's all said and done and, uh, you're done with business and you, you want to retire, are you going to find a farm somewhere to just? You know what? I'm probably going to find a place on the water. <laughs> <laughs> My, I love being, especially like in the, you know, BC interior uh, oh, yeah. lakes, like the Okanagan and the shoe shop. I love being out there. So in a perfect world, I'm sitting on a waterfront property and, sipping my wine on the dock and, you know, spending my mornings floating on the paddleboard, my afternoons on the boat. And yeah, there. I've got the, the visual. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, uh, Carly, for uh, joining us today. Okay. It's been a pleasure. All right. That was uh, Carly Gramlich, who is uh, founder and CEO of Upper District. I'm Mario Taniguzzi, Managing Editor of Canada's Podcast. Today on Edmonton's Podcast, thanks for joining us today.